In this video, I want to talk about how one way of estimating the marginal likelihood by a sort of sampling method, which some people call simple Monte Carlo, actually fails in practice, and why we need to think of other ways to estimate the marginal likelihood should we actually want to obtain this quantity. So firstly, just a reminder of what the marginal likelihood is. We've got Bayes' rule here on the left. The denominator of Bayes' rule, P of X, is what we refer to as the marginal likelihood. And we're interested in this because it allows us to do model comparison. And this denominator term, P of X, is sometimes actually written as Z, where Z stands for the partition function in statistical mechanics. So I'm going to write, you know, just to be clear here, Z is equal to P of X. How do we obtain that mathematically? Well, we obtain it by integrating the numerator of Bayes' rule, and that's given by the product of the likelihood times the prior. And we're integrating with respect to our parameter vector theta here. So just to be clear here, the integral here is in principle an n-dimensional integral, where n is the number of parameters that you have in your model. And we know from practice that actually calculating n-dimensional integrals is very difficult if n is above about 3. So what can we do? Well, firstly, I want to sort of take a bit of a sidestep and think about how would I work out the expected value of our parameter theta. Let's imagine that theta is unidimensional now for, for just argument's sake. How would I do that? Well, the idea here is that what you would do is you would integrate the product of theta times p of theta d theta, where p of theta is some given density. So this would be the expectation of theta under the density p. So p here could stand for our prior density, for example. Let's now imagine that theta is actually a vector here. Does anything change? Well, no, except the fact that we're now doing an n-dimensional integral, and that actually becomes quite a lot harder. But we know a way to work out n-dimensional integrals, or to approximate them at least, if we can use sampling. Because the idea here is that we know that we can approximate this by 1 over n, where n is the sample size, times the sum from i equals 1 to n of theta i, where theta i is being sampled from our density p of theta. So in other words, what we do is we replace the population mean of theta with its sample equivalent where we're sampling from the given density with which we're evaluating the expectation with respect to. And this kind of replacing integrals with sums, or the sample mean, is what underlies the whole sort of concept of Markov chain Monte Carlo, or Monte Carlo in general, really. Okay, so that's how we work out the expected value of a parameter. Can we use that to help us to work out our value of our marginal likelihood? So, to be able to see if we can or not, we need to look at both of the terms of the marginal likelihood. First of all, looking at this first term, this is the likelihood. And we know by virtue of the fact that we've called it a likelihood, that it's not actually a valid probability distribution. It's not a valid probability distribution because when I vary theta and I hold x constant, it doesn't behave like a valid probability distribution. In other words, it doesn't integrate to 1. So we're not going to be able to evaluate the expectation of something with respect to this density because it's not a valid probability density. However, this thing here, being our prior probability density, is a valid probability density. Hence, what we can do is we can write down z as just being equal to the expected value under the prior density p of our likelihood, p of x given theta. And then, well, how can we work that out? Because remember that this is actually a multidimensional integral. It's that multidimensional integral up here. We can work this out by sampling. So what we could do is we could say, well, this is approximately equal to 1 over n times the sum from i equals 1 to n of p of x given theta i, where theta i is being drawn independently sampled from our prior density p of theta. And just to be clear, the, the n which I'm using both here and here is different to the sort of n which I'm do, using up here to represent the number of parameter dimensions that I have. 
here down the bottom here it's just the sample size. So this sort of process here of sampling our parameters from our prior density and then calculating the sample mean value of the likelihood is what some people refer to as simple Monte Carlo. It might not seem that simple to you but it's the simplest sort of mechanism that we can come up with to help us to estimate the marginal likelihood. So what are the issues that I alluded to earlier with this kind of mechanism? Well, to illustrate this problem, I'm going to use an example. So the example I'm going to use here is that we're going to imagine our data x comes from a normal distribution with some mean mu and some standard deviation sigma. So I've got a two-dimensional model here. It's got two parameters, mu and sigma. And we're going to imagine here that mu and sigma have a given prior P of mu and sigma, which is weakly informative. In other words, there is relatively little information in this prior. And what we're going to see here is that what we could do is we can estimate our marginal likelihood z by just taking 1 over our sample size times the sum from i equals 1 to n of n, our normal density, p of x, given mu and sigma. So this is just our sort of each of our likelihoods. And we're sampling here mu and sigma i. So to be clear here, I'm imagining that I've got a fixed sample x, let's say of 50 individuals is what I'm going to show you simulations for. So the i here is just the, the i for an individual. So actually maybe I'll rewrite this as j just so we don't get confused. Whereas here, down at the bottom here, we are sampling sort of n times from our prior distribution, p of mu and sigma, and we're using the likelihoods that we calculate for each value of mu and sigma that we sample from our priors to help us to estimate the marginal likelihood. And we're going to see that the problem with this is that whilst this is a valid estimator for our marginal likelihood, we're going to see that the variance of our marginal likelihood is huge. And the reason that the variance is so large is due to the pathologies of this particular integral. It's because when we use weakly informative priors or relatively uninformative priors, the sort of value of z is dictated by essentially the position of the likelihood and where that likelihood overlaps with the prior which in parameter space is a very small region. And this small region means that if we use sampling to estimate z by sampling from our prior, essentially almost all of the points that we sample from our prior make virtually no contribution to our marginal likelihood. And because of that, we get a very, very rough approximation to z and a very slowly converging approximation to z if we use simple Monte Carlo. So I'm now going to show you this by means of a Mathematica simulation. Okay, so this is a representation of our likelihood and our prior. So I've said I've just sort of simulated some data x from a normal distribution. And so we've got two dimensions to our parameter space here. We've got one mu and another one sigma. And I've shown the position of our likelihood, which I've scaled so that it can kind of be compared with our prior, which is here in blue. So we can see here that the two of these things actually overlap in a relatively narrow region, or at least you know the likelihood is, is a sort of non-negligible value in only a very narrow region of parameter space. And it's this kind of small region of overlap which means that the method of sort of simple Monte Carlo provides a very noisy estimate of the marginal likelihood. So another way of representing this kind of distribution here is to use contour plots. So what we could do is we could instead draw this as a contour plot, where on the left here I've sort of shown the prior, and we can see the prior here is sort of relatively gradually changing. It's got relatively spaced out contours, whereas the likelihood is much more focused on a small region of parameter space. And what we're now going to do is we're going to essentially sample from this prior density here and we're going to plot each of the points that we sample on our likelihood space. And we're going to see that the majority of points that we sample lie nowhere near this kind of area of, of high uh, likelihood, meaning that they contribute essentially nothing to our sum 
that we use to approximate our marginal likelihood. So here on the left, as I say, I've just got the likelihood that I've drawn, and we've got a single point at the moment that we've sampled from our prior entity. And we can see that because this point lies a long way away from any region of high uh, likelihood, essentially at the moment, we don't have a marginal likelihood on the scale that I have at the moment. It's somewhere way down here. Essentially, our estimate of the marginal likelihood is far too small to show on the current scale. And so here on the, on the right, what I've got is I've got the actual true value of the marginal likelihood for this example, which I've shown as the dotted line. I've got a scale which is logarithmic, so it's varying by sort of six orders of magnitude, a huge uh, sort of scale here that we've actually got. And here I've got the number of samples from the posterior. So currently we're at one and you can't actually see our current sort of sample average estimate of the marginal likelihood. And what I'm now going to do is I'm going to run this and we're going to see points uh, appearing on this plot that we've sampled from our prior and that's going to update our estimate of the marginal likelihood. So if I now run this, we can see that we're getting points starting to appear and this point here had a non-negligible value of likelihood, so we actually got a jump up here. And what I've done here is I'm actually going to show the points in red that really contribute to the marginal likelihood estimate. So you can actually see that when this point appeared here, our current estimate of the marginal likelihood jumped up significantly. And then again, we sample a value of, uh, we get a sample from a prior, which happens to be in an area of high likelihood, and our sort of estimate jumps up again. Uh, similarly, because we're already kind of a high value of marginal likelihood, that next sort of value we sampled from our prior didn't contribute much. And if we sort of let this run for a bit longer, eventually we get another point. And so finally, we've jumped up above our kind of true value of our marginal likelihood. So if I stop this and I just sort of let it run to the end, we can see here that I've had to, even for this relatively simple example, I've simulated 200 draws from my prior distribution, and it's it's kind of the convergence to the marginal likelihood estimate hasn't been particularly smooth. It's been a very noisy journey that we've taken to get there. And you can see that because of this kind of small region of parameter space that actually contributes to our marginal likelihood, it actually means that if we use this simple Monte Carlo method, we get a very kind of lumpy estimate of marginal likelihood. And it's not clear exactly how many samples from our prior we would need to take, even for this simple example, to be able to reliably say we've now got a reasonably good estimate of the marginal likelihood. And for a more complicated case where we've got many more parameter dimensions and let's say we've got a lot of data, this problem is even compounded even more. So what do we see? We see that the simple Monte Carlo method is not a very practically useful way of determining the marginal likelihood because of the pathologies in the integral that you need to do to work out the marginal.